I think one of the things that um, most commonly comes up when people are exploring narcissistic abuse and why and how narcissistic abuse plays out is the fact that narcissistic abuse is, is a bewildering experience. Um, the target ends up feeling like they're trapped inside of a cult of one person, one leader, one follower. And in this confusion that's deliberate, uh, the person, the target will feel like uh, they are unmoored and unanchored from the normal coordinates of, of reality, which of course, in that moment, whilst they're being narcissistically abused, they are. And they'll ask, why is this happening? Why does he do that? Why does she do that? There's a few uh, key elements uh, that we should understand this. So if you're trying to understand baseline narcissistic behavior, like um, um, uh, gaslighting or a reframing, um, DAVO, uh, you know, where they reverse victim offender and, and they deny everything and everything is always put, put back on you. The first thing we need to understand is that the uh, framework for the narcissistic personality is a defensive framework. It's rooted in lack. It's rooted in insecurity. It's rooted in the sense that I am not enough as I am. So I need a, an artificial, delusional and grandiose defense mechanism is this actually live? Yes. Uh, in order to live, in order to survive. Typically, this will have taken place uh, in childhood. There'll be an environment where there's a, a peculiar type of childhood trauma that's taking place, where the child is held between two polarities. One polarity of information is telling them that they're amazing, and the other polarity of information is telling them that they're absolutely awful. No matter what you do, no matter what you do, you're amazing. No matter what you do, you're awful. Both of these um, messages are delusion inducing because they're both false. The child is neither amazing and godlike, nor are they awful and demonic because they're a child. So realistic feedback is not getting in. So this is a defensive shell that is created around the authentic vulnerable emotions to protect the authentic vulnerable self. And I believe this is why it's completely impenetrable by traditional talk therapy, because the narcissistic personality is designed to keep data out and to keep vulnerability in. So in therapy, there is a process by which your um, blind spots are highlight highlighted, and that's not always going to feel good. Some of it is going to feel uncomfortable because they're your blind spots and you're not used to talking about them. And it translates essentially as a kind of negative feedback that's been given to you. And the narcissistic personality is designed to stop that from happening. The therapy also requires that we be authentic, that we be vulnerable, and the narcissistic personality can't do that. So it's defensive in its essence. So when you are trying to create adult to adult communication, for resolution, as you would in other areas of your life where there is conflict, that's doing nothing more than playing further into the narcissistic abuse trap. That's how you get stuck. That's how you get trapped. The second thing that we need to understand is this concept of splitting. Splitting is, is um, a concept in psychology that the first level of it is pretty simple, but then it, it becomes complex. The first level of it, you could roughly understand as splitting as a defense against nuance. It's a defense against shades of gray. Human beings generally, but when we are children particularly, we don't really deal with nuance. In fact, a child can't deal with shades of gray. A person or a thing in psychoanalytic theory, an object, um, because people are objects in psychoanalytic theory, nice, uh, is either satiating me or frustrating me when I'm a small infant. I'm either receiving good or I'm not receiving anything and therefore receiving bad. So that the, the people are altogether good, they're altogether bad. So splitting, you split individuals, institutions, nations, ethnicities, uh, 
uh, situations into altogether good, altogether bad. You'll know this from elsewhere. You'll know that this is uh, called black and white thinking when we're talking about uh, post-traumatic stress. People with post-traumatic stress engage in black and white thinking. The narcissistic, uh, the child before they develop narcissistic personality disorder is in an environment where they are being split. So the child is being split into separate objects that are altogether good and altogether bad by parents who presumably are either drunk, high, insane, or highly narcissistic and or highly narcissistic themselves. They're tyrannical, they're delusional, they're out of touch with reality, they're out of touch with themselves, and they do this peculiar and particular style of childhood abuse where they say the child is altogether good and altogether bad. So the narcissistic child is being given two different signals and the narcissist starts to split themselves. All of the bad parts, they push away, they suppress, they repress, they deny, they um, um, disavow is the psychoanalytic language, and all of the good but false data that they're being told about themselves is wonderful and amazing, they embrace. All that is good is me. All that is bad is not me, is the rule by which they learn to operate. When they get into a relationship with the other, so the, the narcissist is, is here, they have two parents or caregivers or parents in an institution, they're receiving split messages, they split themselves. So they now go through time as a split. They're two, they're not one, they are two. There's all of the bad stuff that's disavowed, that's shoved away, and there's all of the good stuff that is um, overconsumed, overindulged, that's them. Anything bad about them is projected outward to the environment, to the culture, to the wife, the husband, the children, uh, the opposing political party, whatever it is. So they were split. Now they split others when they get into a relationship with another person. It's very strange because they start to do two things that sound contradictory simultaneously. And this is why it's such a wild ride and so confusing for the target. What they will do is they will simultaneously fuse with the target. They merge with the target. They don't have you come into their life as a separate person. They love you. They appreciate you. They respect your individuality. They respect your sovereignty. Um, they have admiration for who you are as a human being, and they can let you be you. No, they have to fuse and merge with you. You become them. They become you. And so you will say, I'm sure at times they were copying me. I'm sure at times they were using phrases that I was using. I'm sure at times they started dressing like me and mirroring me. Yes, they were merging with you. So even as they're merging with you and becoming one with you, they are also splitting you. So they are carrying uh, battling interjects like the dueling banjos from um, Deliverance, the movie Deliverance. Did ling ding 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 ding. They have these dueling interjects, and that creates a tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance, which is somatically experienced stress because the human being has two conflicting messages operating at the same time, two conflicting sources of data, two conflicting um, and absolutely uh, the one is the antithesis of the other beliefs operating at the same time, which generates a huge amount of stress. So they are already split. They then start splitting others. You get closer to them. And as you get closer to them, you are fused and merged with them. But even as you are fused and merged with them, you are split by them. They are split. They experience themselves as split, and then they split the world. So we usually think of the, um, the phases of narcissistic abuse, something that I've never been quite comfortable with because it didn't reflect my experience. Uh, you know, love bombing, everything is wonderful. I didn't really experience that myself. I know some people do. 
and then everything is great for a while, and then you go into a devaluation phase. It's extremely unlikely that the timeline is so neat. It's extremely unlikely, uh, based on the, the structure and the infrastructure of narcissistic personality disorder, that it goes, you are very good. I like you very much. I love you, I love you, I love you. Oh, no, now I'm very disappointed and I'm going to devalue you. It's very unlikely. It's far more likely that this uh, so-called devaluation phase um, that we experience uh, further down the timeline, three months, six months, when the quote-unquote honeymoon period is over, um, began at least unconsciously immediately. And what would have happened is that the devaluation would have been disavowed. It would have been thrown into the unconscious. So as they disavow their own negatives, they would have disavowed your negatives. So the things that, that didn't match their narcissistic fantasy of who you were, they were just pushed to one side and it gets pushed into the same place that all the things that devalue their grandiose sense of self is also pushed into. So it's a little bit more complicated than the way that we normally talk about it. But I think it's important to understand this because when you have a map that accurately reflects the reality of what was actually happening, you can experience true satiation. You can go, oh my God, this, this is what, yes, this is why I felt so crazy. This was what was happening to me. And then you know what to do about it when you move forward with a therapist and get on with your life. So the devaluation phase will have taken, will have started immediately but the bad parts of you, the so-called bad parts of you in the eyes of the narcissist would have been split off and put in another place. They're idealizing themselves. They're simultaneously idealizing you. You are drawn in through uh, an unconscious process of mirroring and looping to idealize them because this is the game you're playing. When we talk about shared fantasies, you can think of them as almost being like live action role plays. You are playing a game at the unconscious level and you must idealize them as a reflection of their idealization of themselves and as a reflection of the idealization of you. You are then semi-consensually fusing and merging with them because when you engage in this relationship, love with a narcissist has a different flavor and a different... Um, a different experience to love with people who are not highly narcissistic. As I say, it's fusing. It's a kind of a fusing into and merging and conjoinment in a non-real world that at times will feel pretty good. At times will feel pretty exciting. It will feel like you're in a movie. It will feel grandiose. It will appeal to your own latent narcissism. And so then you go in time, they have split themselves, they've split you, they're fundamentally defensive, an awful lot of what they're doing as they're doing it in the relationship, and you're like, yeah, okay, Richard, I got all that, but why did she say this? Why did he do that? Why, when they already had these needs satiated, did they have to go elsewhere to get more of their needs satiated? Well, you're using the coordinates of a non-narcissistic person to try to understand the highly narcissistic person. We must never forget that fundamentally they're trying to acquire supply. Now, narcissistic supply is one of these subjects that I feel like in the narcissism online community sort of glossed over. And we've all gone, yeah, yeah, we know what narcissistic supply is. They need admiration. They need to be told that they're wonderful. Yes, but why? But why? So if you look at this model that says they're fundamentally splitting themselves and splitting the partner, they're fusing with the partner, why do they need narcissistic supply? Because the only thing, the only time they can experience anything that approximates confidence, that approximates a stable sense of self-love, a stable sense of safety, a stable sense of being in relationship with another human being, is when they're experiencing applause and admiration from an audience. So narcissistic supply is not just reaffirm my grandiose vision of myself to me. It is that, but it is also, I need applause from an audience. And I, I need you, uh, good people, 
who follow me and are hoping to overcome these narcissistic abusive relationships to hear me. When you offer them love, that's not what they want. When you try to be the perfect partner, that's not really what they want. It's okay. It's okay. Here's what they want. And you're giving them something that's adjacent to what they want. It's only adjacent to it, though. It's never going to satisfy them. They learned that what love was when they were growing up, the only time they experienced any validation and anything that was adjacent to genuine love and care from their primary caregivers, let's say their parents, to keep it simple, is when they performed in the theatrical sense, they did something and the light of their performance drew applause and it reflected through a mirror back on the parent. So, so they, the narcissistic child had to do a thing that drew applause and drew, let's say, light as a metaphor for, for love. It drew light and then the light through the mirror shone back onto the parent, the highly narcissistic parent uh, or alcoholic or drug addicted or tyrannical egomaniac parent. They then became activated. They then became aroused by this admiration that, that their child, that they fused with, because that child isn't a separate human being growing into their own adult. No, 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 no. That child is a manifestation and reflection of me. This is me. I just watched uh, the movie The Iron Claw the other night. It's a true story of a family, a tragic story of a family of wrestlers um, who are, without uh, spoiling anything, bullied and um, manipulated and cajoled into uh, fulfilling their father's fantasies of wrestling. And it becomes apparent as you watch the movie, what the, because the Iron Claw is this wrestling move. That's his signature move. That's how he draws a submission, crushes, he pretends to crush the person's skull. And they go, ah, and they submit. But it becomes clear as you watch the movie, what the Iron Claw really is in terms of domination of will and who the instrumentalized five fingers of the Iron Claw are. The child is forced to draw love and attention from an audience so that it reflects not onto the child, but onto the parent. As they grow up, they learn to draw applause and attention so that it shines not onto them but onto the grandiose self so this is only uh, reality interacting with superego i know it's a bit i know this is a little bit complicated um i know it is so the superego by now if you've been watching me for a while you'll know what this is it's a bad translation of a freudian concept freud said uh, what we call the ego in psychoanalytic theory, Freud just said ich, which is German for I or self. And the superego was the uber ich, which is the over self, the over I. So there's the self, and then there's the over self. The over self is the internalized parent, largely speaking. Keep it simple. Largely speaking, it's the part of you that is parental, parent like. It talks down to you and tells you what to do. Do that, it's good. Yes, daddy, yes, mommy. Don't do that, it's bad. Oh, yes, yes, daddy, yes, mommy. You get a smack. Oh, the negative superego injunction. Oh, it doesn't feel good. But when I'm a good boy, oh, that feels good. I'm a good boy. So what's happening with the narcissist? They have to draw applause for performance. Go watch the Iron Claw. A really good performance, winning in front of the crowd, even though it's all theatrics, it's not. It's the, like WWE wrestling is a very hard athletic endeavor, but it's not real competition. It's theater. You draw the love of the audience. And when you draw the love of the audience, you, you, I, I didn't actually know until I watched the iron claw that this is how it works. That's how they have championships. Championships belts are rewarded for, uh, for, uh, the drawing of effectively narcissistic supply for drawing the love and the applause of the audience. That's how they were ranked in the 80s and 90s. God knows how it works out. It's, it's not really my thing, but it's a good movie, The Iron Claw. So what you end up with is a situation where the, the child has become an adult and they're obsessed with drawing applause, not even for them. 
the people's love, the people's admiration is not even, they're not even consuming it. They are like narcissists are like the servile, Gollum-esque, wretched slaves of some dark, invisible Moloch like God that they themselves can't even see. And you are the blood sacrifice. People are the blood sacrifice and people are interchangeable, largely speaking. Some people are better than others because they have good contacts. Oh, this one's associated with academia. This one's associated with media. This one's associated with politics. This one's very beautiful. This one's very clever. That's higher supply because it, it's, it's better supply. It's like higher quality uh, uh, cocaine. There's low grade cocaine. It's been stepped on a lot. And then there's very pure, you know, Peruvian flake. That's the higher quality cocaine. That's the one we want to go for. But largely speaking, it's just grist for the mill. Because Moloch is constantly hungry. Moloch here is the superego injunction of the tyrannical father or the tyrannical all-consuming mother. It's never fed. It's never satiated. Whatever wonderful thing you do today, you go asleep, you wake up tomorrow morning, it's just as hungry again. And it's screaming at them for more supply. So they're compelled to go out and gather more supply. So you are drawn into this nightmarish horror show world that is all related to the fact that they are split because they are mutilated in this way where they are split. They split the world. They then split you, even as they fuse with you, all of the stuff that eventually is going to be used in the devaluation discard phase is there immediately, but they're operating by idealizing you even as they idealize themselves. And then you will join in. It's, it's not your fault. I did it. We all do it. You will join in and idealizing them. And the payoff for you idealizing them and joining in in this sick game is that they will idealize you. So, so you will experience a highly narcissistically gratifying, idealized version of yourself in which you are more beautiful, in which you are more intelligent, in which you have greater integrity, in which you have whatever you're being praised for, whatever, whatever it is, the performative thing that draws their applause for. And they offer applause. Narcissistic personality disorder people are perfectly capable of fawning. They're not stuck on fight mode all the time. Perfectly capable of being charming, perfectly capable of being seductive, perfectly capable of being kind, perfectly or seemingly kind, perfectly capable of offering compliments. Of course, it's all a manipulation to secure and gather narcissistic supply. Once they've ga- engaged in fusing, even as they're splitting you, they have another job to fulfill. There has to be the sacrifice. Moloch, the uh, great owl, I think sometimes Moloch was a bull, um, needs uh, fresh victims to be thrown into the, into the furnace for the, for the blood sacrifice. So your doom was inevitable. There's nothing that you did that, that uh, meant that you became devalued. I claim your devaluation starts the minute they meet you. It's just that they de- they disavow the devaluation in the way that they disavow the devaluating messages they receive about themselves. As the time of your sacrifice draws near, God, I remember, that reminds me, there's, there's, there's an Aztec uh, process for this, where some victims of a certain type of sacrifice to certain gods would live for a year knowing they were going to be sacrificed. But for 365 days, for a full go around the sun, they had a wonderful life. They were treated as the God that they were to be sacrificed to for 365 days. And every day, their doom drew nearer as surely as the spinning of the earth and the turning around the sun. It was always going to happen. It's necessary. It's an unconscious compulsion to seduce and betray, to seduce and sacrifice. It doesn't matter how wonderful you are. And people have asked me, like, will they be sad? Yeah, there'll be moments of melancholy, you know. There'll be moments of, you know, I missed that that tool. That was like a really good wrench. That was my favorite lawnmower. That was a wonderful washing machine. God, she was a great washing machine. God, he was he was a great lawnmower wasn't he yeah the the good times but you know god's got to be served and i'm the only real person on this lonely planet and so had to be replaced oh well 
kind of a shrug and a wry smile and well you've got to do what you got to do god's got to eat and so you then move into what is largely called the devaluation phase um but i think that this is is uh, triggered at an unconscious level because they know that a sacrifice has to be made i won't become graphic because i don't know why i know so much about aztec sacrifice <laughs> how do i even know this i can't remember where i got this from but there's um let's say let's say uh, very briefly and metaphorically speaking if you want to make sure the rain falls on the crops and you're going to sacrifice a group of people a certain group of people to the gods of rain uh, you need to make that group of people cry so there are things that need to happen before the sacrifice that are bloody awful uh, because the more they cry, uh, the more rain there will be for the crops. And I think it's kind of like that. And this is where we see sadism and, and cruelty. And there are real barbs left behind. There's real shards and bits of shrapnel left in the flesh. And you think, why? Why be so egregious? Why be so cruel and sadistic? Just dispose of me and move on no that's that's not enough you must suffer and is this sadism i don't know i'll just go ahead and say i don't know maybe sometimes but i think sometimes it's just this is what is necessary sorry comrades this is what the god demands of me and demands of us all you must suffer i can't just leave you to get on with your life and be like, hey, hey, okay, you know, I, uh, oh, I did a month of therapy, I did an ay ayahuasca retreat, banged out some hot yoga, and I think I'm ready to. I learned a few lessons, I wrote a small book, and you know, I'm ready to get back in the dating market. Mm -mm. No, they must be left wounded. They must be left mutilated. They must be left in some way permanently marked by me in order for it to be a good sacrifice. If it's a good sacrifice, a nasty, savage, cruel, humiliating, destructive, and scarring devaluation and uh, disposal, dismissal phase, then the superego tyrant god Moloch will be more satiated and will reward the narcissist not with more pleasure but with less pain it really is a different vision of narcissism but the narcissist is a frightened golem-esque worn out mutant slave that's been destroyed by its addiction to this perverted cycle to this evil uh, um, god that requires human sacrifice where they live in fear. They live in fear of the God. They live in fear of the superego injunction. They live in fear of its punishment. The angry mother, the angry father is pain and death. But if I can do this, if I can pull this off again, I can make it so that I am not the one cast into the flames. I can make it so that I am not the one who is sacrificed. Let it be someone else, but not me. And yes, there are moral issues and it's not so nice. But, you know, I actually am better than everybody else. And people really are just cattle. And in many ways, didn't they bring it on themselves?